All right, welcome everyone uh, to Comstack. This is our first meeting of the fall and with a new Comstack membership team. Uh, I wanna welcome all of them and could I have the next slide please? All right, I am James Hatt. I am the DFO, the Designated Federal Officer this meeting is being held pursuant to the notice published in the Federal Register on November 30th, 2022. The agenda for the meeting was announced at that notice with details is set out in the agenda posted on the Comstack website. As I said, I'm designated federal officer responsible for compliance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act under which this meeting is conducted. It is my responsibility to see that all the agenda items are adhered to and that the accurate minutes are kept. I also have the responsibility to adjourn the meeting should I find it necessary to do so in the public interest. Only Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee Comstack members may participate in any discussion and vote on matters put to a vote by the chair. There are some updates to the agenda which I have posted in the next slide and on our website. I have approved these changes at the request of the chair. Could I have the next slide, please? This is the new agenda and I will also mention that this meeting is being recorded as well as being uh, publicly available on YouTube. Uh, the recording of this, along with all the slides and any other materials uh, that Comstack is using, will be available on our website shortly after this meeting. With that, I want to turn it over to uh, Karina Dries, the chair of Comstack. Karina, over to you. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate it. I believe we might be a little a little bit out of order um, in the introductory remarks from the Department of Transportation. Is that correct? The secretary should be here if he is not already. Um, he is first. Okay, great. Excellent. There we go. The secretary just joined. Thank you so much and thank you, Jim, and welcome Comstack members. Thank you for joining the inaugural meeting of this Comstack. It is my pleasure to introduce the 19th Secretary of the Department of Transportation, the Honorable Pete Buttigieg to provide some opening remarks. Hi, well, thanks very much and uh, appreciate the chance to uh, uh, take a few uh, moments at, at the outset of this gathering, uh, really mainly just to thank all, all of the members of our uh, Comstack, new members and returning members. I understand we have 21 new members since I last spoke to this group in May. Uh, so I want to welcome you and thank you for taking this on. Uh, and uh, again, a, a big thank you to everybody who's returning to this service too. It's, it's an incredible and uh, fast paced time for space travel as everybody here knows. Uh, the last time we spoke, we had just celebrated the Axiom One mission, bringing the first all private crew to the uh, International Space Station. Uh, this week, we saw the Orion spacecraft coming back from the moon 50 years to the day after the Apollo 17 uh, moon mission. And you know, in many ways, we are seeing what was built on the foundations of that Apollo program a half century ago. But uh, unlike that period a half century ago, where it was uh, a uh, public sector enterprise and one that played out in, in the shadow of the Cold War space race, uh, we are now in a very different environment as we see more and more uh, activities going on on the commercial side. And we see more and more players uh, way far beyond the, the uh, bipolar superpower competition that was dominating the conversation about space uh, a generation or two ago. And right now we, we have a responsibility to make sure that the way this plays out is safe, that the innovations that take place support the public good, and that the development of a market uh, is uh, playing out in ways that are responsible too. Uh, we're just at, at the very outset of what will over time become a space that very much needs to be managed and regulated appropriately. Again, not just for safety, but, but for uh, public good and of course for the national interest as well. Uh, and that's where we come in. Uh, uh, so many of the things that we're working on right now, I think are going to uh, uh, call for uh, uh, solutions in, in the coming months and years debris mitigation, smarter re-entries, uh, a lot of interesting work going on about alternative fuels. Uh, and right now we're building a legislative proposal to expand core safety principles to orbital activities as well. So we will continue working 
with our uh, interagency partners, with the White House, with the National Space Council, and uh, uh, continue working uh, with all of you uh, to gather your insights and to make sure that uh, our policies are keeping up with the technologies and the markets that, that are emerging here. We also have an opportunity right now to make sure that the fast expanding field of uh, space travel is increasingly reflecting the American people. We're excited to see more people of color, uh, more women well represented here. And uh, we have a lot of partnerships with uh, so many in this sector to help to improve diversity in STEM education that I think ultimately will help to shape uh, what space and aerospace look like in the, uh, in the years and, and decades to come. Uh, so again, I want to thank you for bringing your expertise and insight uh, to this field uh, and to this body that's helping us to make important policy decisions. I want to urge you to buckle up uh, for the uh, pace and importance of this work to accelerate as we see this exponential growth in the licensing of commercial, commercial space travel. And I want to urge you to be imaginative uh, and innovative. Uh, we should make sure that there is as much imagination and innovation going into our policy solutions and guidelines as there is going into the technology itself. And I know that we have the right people in this body to do just that. So thank you again for your commitment to this important kind of service. And uh, I'm looking forward to continuing to follow the results and, and the recommendations of the work that you're doing at gatherings like this. Take care and back over to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. We really appreciate you joining us today. I'd like to turn it over to Acting FA Administrator, Mr. Billy Nolan. Well, thank you, uh, Karina, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's so great to be with you today and echoing uh, my comments will mirror much of the Secretary's comments. And we do welcome our 20 new com committee members. And I also want to welcome the seven returning committee members and, and to you, Karina, as the new chair and to Mike French, who is the uh, vice chair. Thank you both for your service. It's really good to see everyone this afternoon. Let me also welcome the members of the public who are tuning in as well to say a quick thank you and to say a quick thank you to the FAA staff who have organized today's meeting. As I'm sure most of you are aware, since CONSTAC last met, Kelvin Coleman was named Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation. And I know he is eager to hear your expert advice. You are, after all, an excitingly diverse and robust group with wide stakeholder representation. We appreciate all you're talking about, uh, all you taking time to serve on this important committee. The work this committee does is a great example of collaboration that is critical for the commercial space industry. We share a common commitment to advancing these operations in the safest and most efficient way possible. The expertise and experience each of you brings to the table informs our oversight work. We are eager to make process, uh, progress and rely on you for the diversity of perspective. In particular, I look forward to hearing your observations, findings, and recommendations today on the draft report to Congress on the Human Spaceflight Safety Network. This is timely given that the moratorium on regulating the safety of participants is set to expire in October. And I'm very interested to hear your recommendations on how the FAA can partner with industry to increase diversity and participation in STEM education. This is critical to attract and develop the type of dynamic, innovative workforce you need. And if you have any doubt about how the industry is growing, just look at the numbers. We just recently marked the 500th FAA license launch with more to come before we close the books on 2022. We've seen more people going to space, including one of the new Comstack members and George Neal, who was Kevin's, Kelvin's predecessor. I appreciate your time today and hope you'll have a productive meeting and a prosperous close to 2022. Here's to looking onward and definitely up, upward. And now with that, I'll turn it over to Kelvin. Thank you, Administrator Nolan, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be here. I'm certainly grateful uh, to Secretary Buttigieg for spending uh, some of his time with us today and his remarks, uh, which were right on the point, uh, giving recognition to the great work uh, that this collective industry does day in and day out to bring benefits to the American public. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, and, you know, certainly 
you know, if three times a charm, uh, I certainly want to add my voice uh, to both secretary and, and that to our acting administrator, Nolan, in welcoming our new uh, and returning uh, Comstack members. Um, first, I'll, I'll speak to our returning members, uh, Karina Dries, uh, our incoming chairman, uh, returning to us from a, a stint uh, previously as the vice chair. We're so happy to have you uh, lead the group. Uh, Mike French, our uh, vice chair, also a returning member. Uh, Ed Bolton, Dale Ketchum, Kate Cronmiller, Mike Moses, and Ann Sokolsky. Uh, again, our returning members, we so much appreciate uh, your time and commitment uh, to the committee and the fact that you've, again, re-upped uh, that commitment to, to continue to serve. Uh, I also want to express gratitude and thanks to our new members, uh, the new Comstack members who, who are new to the, to the committee, uh, Joe DePete, Matt Dunn, John Elbon, Tony Frago, Dr. Mariva Ja, Therese Jones, Dr. David Newman, General Ted Mercer, Megan Mitchell, Dr. George Neal, Doc, uh, Dr. Michelle Parker, Melanie Presser, Karen Shinnewark, Amanda Simpson, Ganesh Siddhar, I knew I was gonna screw this one up, Sid Argaman, Jay Skylas, Sita Santi, Janice Starzik, Melanie Strickland, and Julie Zola. Again, thank you all for uh, making this commitment uh, to uh, take upon a very important endeavor, which is providing support and advice to the Department of Transportation and the Federal Aviation Administration uh, with respect to commercial space transportation oversight. Uh, we have a, a very focused mission on public safety uh, with respect to US commercial launch and reentry activities. And as the administrator said, we've done what we think is a pretty good job of, of, of that and carrying that mission out. We've had more recently accomplished 500, as the administrator mentioned, successful launches uh, without anyone in the public uh, being hurt or, or seriously injured or fatally injured, I should say. That's a great safety record and one that we, we intend to and hope to keep uh, moving forward. It took us about, uh, let's see, 30 some odd years, I may be off a few years, to achieve 500 launches. Uh, great achievement, again, with uh, outstanding safety record. Uh, my prediction is we will probably see 500 launches uh, a lot quicker than the next 30 years. We'll probably see 500 launches over the course of the next few years. I'd say probably five years so if I can make a prediction on that. So uh, the pace of industry is, is certainly uh, made an uptick. Uh, and one of the big challenges that we face day in and day out as an organization is attempting to keep pace with the industry. Uh, the commercial space transportation sector, uh, as we all know, has become increasingly complex and more diverse with more actors uh, getting into the game. And uh, commercial space transportation at the FAA uh, has certainly, because of that, uh, received more attention, uh, not only from our organization uh, in AST, but the entire organization. We're working very closely with our partners in the air traffic organization, the aviation safety organization, the airports organization, uh, to ensure that, again, this, this is a safe industry and that we continue to do our part uh, to enable the industry uh, moving forward. And that's a job that we take very seriously. And we look forward to, again, uh, your recommendations and your advice uh, and how we can go about our business to carry out that function and, and the most a beneficial way and the most value added way. Um, you know, we focus a lot on public safety, obviously, uh, but in my conversations that I have with industry, I oftentimes hear, you know, about ways that we can improve our value proposition. And that's something we're certainly interested in. Uh, we wanna keep things safe, uh, but we also wanna make determinations uh, at a quicker pace. We want, again, trying to keep pace with industry. We wanna do things to, uh, improve our internal processes. We want to improve our communications. We want to have a better uh, uh, risk management, uh, risk sharing, if you will, regime with our industry partners. We want to have a good balance there moving forward. And so those are some of the things that, that we're working on in AST uh, to improve uh, how we provide service uh, to the launch 
uh, and a reentry sector. Now, as Billy mentioned, uh, you know, since we last met, uh, I've had the great privilege to be named Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation and AST. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a 26 year veteran of, of commercial space in the FAA. And, uh, you know, it's a great privilege for me to, to lead a great organization like AST. Uh, we talk a lot about it. You heard the secretary and as well as the acting administrator talk about diversity, equity and inclusion. And that's something that's been a great focus uh, not only through the department, uh, but within the agency, but also within AST. Um, uh, since we last met, or maybe even, well, maybe since we last met, we we've undergone some some additional reorganization, and we've we've structured the, the organization in a way that allows us to uh, take on the additional growth that we think we need to take on. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment uh, to to meet the demands of the industry. Uh, but in so doing, we've also lent our attention to becoming a more uh, diverse organization. And I'm happy to say that we've done that. Uh, prior to our reorganization efforts, uh, we were 87% men, 13% women in our managerial ranks. Uh, after the reorganization, our managerial ranks are comprised of 55% men, 45% women. So we're really happy with that movement. We also see uh, more people of color in our managerial ranks as well. And we're also seeing that reflect those types of changes uh, reflected in our staff. And so we're, we're really happy uh, to see those, those things happen within our organization. Um, also, since we last met, uh, we've had a, a great opportunity to work with the National Transportation Safety Board uh, to stand up uh, a new memorandum of agreement uh, between the FAA, the National Transportation Safety Board on commercial space launch accidents. And this was something that got quite a bit of industry attention and as it should have. And uh, I think after a few months of, of work on that, uh, a lot of hard work and uh, you know, a lot of uh, informal and sometimes formal uh, comments and contributions from, from, our, uh, from our vast group of stakeholders, we were able to hammer out agreement uh, with the National Transportation Safety Board that I think sets things in the right order with respect to roles and responsibilities. Uh, as many of you know, we've had a, a MOU or MOA with the NTSB in place for a number of years uh, that uh, set certain conditions by which the NTSB would lead investigations. Uh, and then also set conditions by which the FAA would lead investigations. And so what we've done here is really clarify that and make that more crystal clear with respect to who does what uh, when there's a, a, a bad day. Uh, and by bad day, what I mean is if someone in the public uh, is hurt or injured, or if someone aboard is seriously hurt or injured. Uh, in those cases, the NTSB, uh, an independent uh, organization to lead the investigation. For all other mishaps, and, and, and I like to say mishaps are a part of our business, uh, it's business as usual insofar as the FAA uh, leading those investigations. So yeah, that's what we've been able to carve out. Now, there's a few more details associated, but that's kind of where the chips fall with respect to um, you know, the roles and responsibilities uh, and, and with respect to commercial space launch accidents. And I want to Give a special thanks to NTSB Chair Jennifer Hammondy for her support and her leadership in uh, helping uh, bring this about. Um, also, it's important to mention that uh, in September we had our last National Space Council meeting in Houston. A uh, great meeting uh, there, uh, well attended, and uh, the Vice President uh, obviously is very focused on, on, on space and. You know, there's a number of things that we're talking about, and there were a couple of actions that were given to the Department of Transportation, um, one of which was to take a look at what we're doing with regards to uh, commercial human spaceflight. Uh, as Billy uh, mentioned, uh, their, the moratorium is set to expire uh, next year in October, and the question is, what is the FAA doing in the interim to uh, ensure that uh, commercial human space flight remains safe. And we've seen a great uh, uptick in commercial human space flight activities 
uh, in recent years and uh, all of which have been safe. And so our focus obviously is to continue uh, that great track record of safety with respect to commercial human spaceflight. Um, as some of you know, uh, we have a couple of efforts underway. One, we are continuing to work on a set of recommended practices uh, that speak to, uh, again, practices with respect to maintenance and operations, et cetera, that uh, operators uh, may carry out uh, to uh, preserve the health and safety of those aboard. Uh, these recommended practices in this current form, these are guidelines, these are not regulations, but again, recommended practices that the agency along with the help of, of NASA has pulled together in recent years. We're updating those recommended practices. We're looking to add, um, you know, how these recommended practices might be complied with or followed, if you will, uh, if a company chose to do so, we think that's helpful. And so that's one of the efforts that we have underway. We've also intensified our engagement with uh, standards development, the standards development organizations such as ASTM, they, they have the F-47 Commercial Space uh, Committee, and they're busy at work uh, standing up uh, standards for uh, commercial space transportation, a subset, of which, a subset of which are standards focused on commercial human spaceflight. And so we have uh, increased our resource commitment uh, to the committee in hopes that we can lend our expertise and help to accelerate uh, the development of those standards in that form. Uh, the third leg of the stool, as I like to refer to it as, is uh, a, uh, the work that we will soon be doing uh, with a, uh, a aerospace rulemaking committee, we call it a SPARC, uh, whereby we can come to the table with the industry and have a face-to-face uh, co um, collaborative conversation about what uh, a safety framework ought to look like uh, for commercial human spaceflight. Uh, we have a charter that's been drafted that's currently under review by the department. Hopefully we will get that uh, charter cleared here in short order so we can begin the work, uh, the very important work that the SPARC will, 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 will undertake uh, in that regard. Uh, so that's what we're doing with respect to commercial human spaceflight. Um, the other area that we're working on is, is both the secretary uh, and, and Billy alluded to as the area of mission authorization. I know this, this audience is very familiar with that. We're talking about uh, on-orbit operations, new and novel in space operations, such as satellite servicing, asteroid mining, commercial space habitats, et cetera. And so we, along with uh, other interagency partners uh, in accordance with the direction given by the vice president, we've submitted proposals to the National Space Council uh, that would speak to how we might uh, go about carrying out that activity. Uh, it's something that we have some experience in. Uh, we've had um, successful efforts uh, with Moon Express in the past, Space IL, where we were able to leverage our payload review process, which is an interagency review process to assess any public safety, national security or foreign policy interest concerns. Um, this is not a licensing process. Uh, there's no environmental review. There's no uh, flight safety analysis or system safety analysis, if you will, concern. It's really a, a policy review by the interagency partners where we are able to flag any concerns uh, that uh, might suggest our national security or foreign policy interests might be negatively impacted or public safety might be negatively impacted. And again, we've had two successful opportunities uh, to have, see that process work uh, and provide uh, the kind of response that was supportive of, of, of in-space operations. And so uh, we want to share that as well. And we continue to have a great conversation with the National Space Council and our partners in commerce and DOD and NASA with respect to an appropriate way forward in that regard. So now let me turn to sort of what lies ahead for AST. We, we talk a lot about uh, keeping pace with industry and that's very important for us. Um, we see, uh, you know, if you've seen any of our briefings in the past, we like to show a cadence uh, chart that shows a, a steady uptick and upswing of launches over the past 10 years. 10 years ago, we were seeing about a launch a month, if you will. Five years later, uh, we were seeing 
um, you know, a, a launch every couple of weeks or so. Just last year, we were up to at least one launch on the average per week. Currently, we're seeing on the average a launch every four and a half days. That's where we are right now. Um, the number of applicants uh, is at an all time high. Uh, we are processing applications, new applications for, uh, for new activities, modifications, waiver requests, uh, you name it. Uh, we're in the business of working that all simultaneously. But we're trying to do things simultaneously with a limited number of staff. Um, and that's become more challenging uh, more recently. Um, and, you know, in recognition of those of these challenges, the president uh, made a very uh, appropriate request uh, to uh, increase our, our, our resources in FY23. And, um, you know, we had both the House and the Senate review that the marks didn't come, quite, come back quite where we were hoping they would, but we we're hoping there's still an opportunity to, to see that through. We're currently on a CR, as most folks know, as everyone knows, of course, and we'll see how that works. But... The, the point that I want to make here is that uh, the work that we do in AST uh, impacts not only the launch and reentry service providers, but uh, their customers as well. Um, we certainly do not want to be and don't intend to be uh, the bottleneck or the slowdown, if you will, uh, that uh, you know, limits or slows down uh, the industry's ability to bring product to market. Uh, we know how important launch is to all of that. It all starts with launch. Uh, you know, all of the great uh, in-space capabilities that we're talking about and all of the benefits that we see from space uh, don't happen if there's not a launch. And so we understand the importance of that. We understand uh, where we sit uh, in the equation, and we want to do our part to make things work uh, smoothly and work well. Uh, but we certainly need the resources to do that. In addition to that, as I already mentioned, you know, there's process improvements and other things that we do, but we are finding that, uh, you know, with a limit num limited number of analysts and a limited number of technical staff, trying to balance and juggle the increased demands that we're seeing it becomes more challenging. We certainly don't want to degrade safety. And so what we've, we've recently contemplated is how do we best manage that uh, given the current environment that we're in. Uh, it's very likely that we will have to uh, prioritize work and put certain work products into, into what we call a queue, if you will. Um, we certainly can't uh, work everything simultaneously at once, uh, given the staff we have. That's, we would love to do that. And we certainly intend to do that. But what we find is when you have analysts who are working multiple projects uh, it can become overwhelming, and that's where you start to drop the ball and lose things. And so we want our analysts very much focused on uh, the products that they're working on. We don't want information and data to get confused or uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so we want people to, to, to be able to put their best effort forward and a very focused effort forward into working with the applicants that are there in front of them. And so what that means is we're going to have to, from a managerial standpoint, uh, and make sure that we are managing the work in a way that allows us to uh, lend our highest quality effort uh, to the evaluations and to the application consultations that we're, we're embarking upon. So we will say more about that uh, moving forward. Um, but it's certainly an endeavor that we wanted to, to make mention of here because we understand that it will have an impact. We have a number of applicants right now who are waiting to, if you will, get into the queue um, and begin pre-application consultations. But we also have a number of applicants that were heavy into evaluations. And so again, with a, a limited number of staff, that becomes a big challenge. And so one of the things that I think would be very helpful from the committee is to sort of help us think through how can we get our message across and how can we uh, improve uh, our situation with respect to getting additional resources that we need and also improving our processes to, to, to create the additional bandwidth uh, that we need to, to move forward. So there are some challenges out there for the committee to take on, and we're really, really looking forward uh, to that. I know, uh, uh, Karina, you and Mike uh, have, uh, are up to the task and ready to take this on and give us the great advice that we're looking for. I know one of the things that is immediately on your, on your, 
on your lap is to take a look at the human space flight safety framework. And we look very much forward to uh, your recommendations in that regard. Uh, this was one of the uh, congressional actions that, legislative actions that we had uh, to take, uh, to look at a framework and we've provided that report. And uh, I look forward to hearing any uh, feedback or any, uh, any recommendations that you may have uh, to help move that forward uh, today. So um, looking forward to a great meeting. Uh, again, I wanna welcome you all uh, to the Comstack. And uh, I've met many of you, uh, some of you I haven't had the privilege of meeting uh, just yet, uh, but I'm very hopeful that uh, in the days uh, soon ahead that we'll have a chance and opportunity to cross paths uh, either uh, in person or on the phone uh, you know, if there's anyone here who needs to reach out to me for anything or anyone on our staff, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, I think we're here to support and help each other. Uh, we have a mutual interest. And again, I look very much forward to, to working with you in this, in this regard and uh, look forward to your recommendations and your observations moving forward in support of commercial space transportation. So thank you very much for your time. And I'll turn the meeting back uh, to Karina at this time. Thank you so much, Kelvin, and thank you to the leadership within the Department of Transportation for recognizing the important role Comstock plays in the commercial space industry. I'm pleased to serve as your chair this term, and Mike and I are excited to work closely with all Comstock members. We have an opportunity to provide some substantial value to the FAA over the next two years as the space economy continues to grow. Um, I'm going to go right into the slides. If we can get the slides back up and go right into the STEM task. Wonderful. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised by the amount of interest and participation from all of you on this first task. We received several responses from the CompStack members and we're gonna to continue to revise the written document with the goal of providing it to AST in January. As we worked on the task, uh, which is right here, how can the FA partner with industry to increase and encourage greater diversity and participation in STEM education, supporting the growing need in the commercial space workforce? We considered several key reasons this topic is so important, which we've listed here. First and foremost, the US space program must maintain assured access to space for the nation, promote economic development and remain innovative. A talented workforce remains a critical component of our nation's goals. Secondly, the space workforce is rapidly growing with more than 150,000 jobs in the core space sector in 2021. The launch sector alone has increased this number by 18% over the past five years. Also, with the shift toward commercialization of the launch sector and to regional space hubs and spaceports, leadership from FAA AST will be helpful in identifying workforce gaps and potential government industry academic partnerships. We also learned there are industry initiatives underway that involve many members of Comstack. I would like to ask General Ed Bolton to provide an overview of the Workforce 2030 initiative next. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Karina. Uh, and thank you all for your interest in this task. Uh, as, as we look at, uh, listen to all of the presentations we heard uh, so far today, clearly uh, space is the future of this country. And within that uh, focus on DEI, it's gonna be important for us to maintain our advantage. Uh, the space force that looks like America will be uh, stronger and better prepared to uh, support our natural interests. The Space Workforce uh, 2030 pledge came about where uh, the, the CEO of the Aerospace Corporation, Steve Isakowitz, uh, started meeting with uh, some of his peer CEOs and uh, about 30 of them at the time uh, decided they would take a Space Workforce pledge uh, to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion within the Space Workforce to uh, get to a more diverse workforce by 2030. Next slide, please. So the pledge is focused on, uh, if you really look across the spectrum uh, where you have workforce from leadership uh, to the actual people who are doing the day-to-day -day work, uh, to interns, to college students, and all the way down to K-12 STEM, we have a pledge in each of those areas. And so increase the number of women employees and un underrepresented groups 
in the technical workforce. And again, as I said, in leaders, uh, the percentage of women and students from underrepresented groups receiving aerospace engineering degrees uh, to levels commensurate with engineering programs. And it's also a sponsor K through 12 programs that collectively reach over 5 million underrepresented students annually. Uh, if you look at these logos, and hopefully many of the members of Comstock will see themselves there, the CEOs of each of these organizations has signed this pledge and it was presented at the last space symposium. Um, perhaps most importantly um, is the fact that they've agreed to publish numbers uh, and, and measure themselves uh, against, those, against those numbers on an annual basis. Uh, next slide, please. So why space and why now? Uh, I think Karina did a pretty good job of, of going through the importance of space. Uh, we expect to, and also Kelvin did. Uh, he talked about it taking 30 years to, to uh, uh, license 500 launches and he expects it'll take much less to, to license the next 500. Uh, well, I just add uh, two things to those points and say, really, if you think about it, space is how we you know, advance the human condition, uh, project power, um, help gain uh, the respect of not just those who support us, but those who might oppose us. And so if we really think of a, a future in which the United States is number one in space, uh, that's a little bit uh, threatening and frightening, I think. And so these are the things that are gonna help us maintain that edge, right? But so far we haven't done as well as we, as well as we could have in space, which means it's the greatest opportunity. Greatest opportunity to make a difference is where you have the biggest challenges and problems. So only 57 people have gone to space have been, have been women, only 14 of them are African-Americans. Uh, less than a third of aerospace and defense industry executives are female, and less than one in 10 of aerospace and industry executives are Black or Hispanic. Uh, so our pledge is oriented towards changing those numbers over time. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, the university pipeline is, is struggling, uh, so we need to put more into the pipeline. And that's why part of the pledge is focusing on K-12 STEM interns and, actual, and on college uh, students as well. Next slide, please. So uh, where do we go from here? Uh, well, we, we've been working with the OSTP in the White House uh, to develop this intern uh, program, intern pledge that was a recent addition uh, to the overall pledge. Uh, we're working a stand-up of, of university partnership program uh, to support this academic pipeline I spoke about. We have social media accounts. Uh, we have spaceworkforce2030.org. We have had our first all 30 signatories meeting uh, on the 28th of October. We plan on a CEO meeting on the, on the 17th of March in preparation for an update at the Space Symposium. Um, uh, and that'll be a summary of everything we've accomplished in the first year. Next slide, please. So join us. Um, we, we've got 30 signatories. Uh, we're certainly hopeful uh, that the Comstock will encourage the FAA to, to join this as well and be a supporting not just a member, but put on conferences, help support these goals that we find so important. Um, you can scan this to join and uh, I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, General. We, we definitely look forward to engaging with you and Aerospace Corporation going forward to see how we can continue participating. Uh, I'm also pleased to hear about progress with the Skilled Technical Workforce Initiative and would like to invite Mike French to provide an update to the Comstack. Mike? Thanks, Karina, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, first off, just to, as way of context here, uh, you know, as we looked at this task, uh, one of the things that we talked about as a group was how much is going on already, right, both across the administration, within individual agencies, uh, as well as within our own companies. And so wanted to highlight some of this ongoing activity because of its relevance, uh, both to the industry and also to many of our members. And, and so the item that Karina just mentioned is uh, at the Space Council meeting in September, the vice president announced a partnership uh, between uh, a host of space companies where they would look for existing workforce development opportunities focused at the skilled technical level. So not STEM four-year degrees, but think about uh, more of the folks um, working on the manufacturing side, uh, skilled technicians, testing, uh, uh, electrical, et cetera. Um, what this effort is gonna do is three things. The first thing is to identify programs that are working now. So not to create another set of programs. Um, 
once those programs are identified, uh, we're going to look to analyze whether those programs can be scaled. Um, many of these programs are producing, uh, they're graduating students in the in the single, the tens uh, tens of digits numbers, when in fact that we need hundreds, if not if not more, uh, workers uh, in these types of jobs. And once we're uh, able to do that analysis, we then want to share those findings both across the industry and across uh, various regions. The effort is focused in three areas along the Florida Space Coast, uh, in the Gulf Coast, and in the Los Angeles um, Long Beach area, known as the you know, South Bay area there of Southern California. Um, right now, we have eight members of Comstack. Eight companies on Comstack are already members in this effort. Uh, there's a broader set of uh, about 12 or 13 uh, companies overall, but this is not closed. Uh, we'll welcome other companies, um, other stakeholders on the technical workforce side to join this effort. Uh, the next step in this effort is going to be regional meetings going on in these three areas. And if you uh, folks, fellow Comstack members or those out in the public or those uh, you know, otherwise following here would be interested in getting involved, uh, you can reach out to me and I'm happy to, to loop you into these regional efforts. Uh, so I'll pause for a second there to see if there's any comments or questions there uh, and then hand it back to you, Prina. All right, great, thanks, Karina. Fantastic. I'm gonna to plan to go through some of these recommendations rather quickly. I don't think I'm going to read off everything, but I'd like to see if we uh, have a couple minutes toward the end of this discussion for folks to chime in, particularly if you think we've missed anything. Uh, we're not finished exactly with this task yet, but we wanted to be able to provide some high level recommendations back to AST today. So uh, to start with, as Mike just mentioned, there are a number of initiatives already underway with, uh, with respect to STEM, as we know that this is a, a, a significant need for our industry. So in order to encourage greater diversity and participation in STEM education, the Comstack first developed several recommendations for the FAA to consider. Uh, and the one that immediately came to mind for a lot of folks is the initiative already underway with the National Space Council to ensure harmonization between uh, STEM workforce efforts and the White House-led Space Industry Skilled Workforce Coalition. So our recommendation is for the Department of Transportation to get much more involved in this effort that's, uh, that's already existing. Um, and in addition to a lot of the STEM initiatives, obviously we know that this administration's very interested in uh, recommendations for diversity, equity, and inclusion as well in the workplace. And this effort already underway with the National Space Council seems to be uh, hitting a lot of these areas that we know are very important to the industry. I'll pause for just a moment to let you read through any of the others that you may not have looked through in the document just yet, but I assume you don't want me to read everything to you, so I won't do that. You know, I'll just add some more color here for the benefit you know, of folks who, who didn't participate um, in the working group level here. And I'll certainly welcome others that were in the working group to chime in here. But I think something that was important to that discussion is that um, st STEM education, uh, STEM career is incredibly important to our industry. Uh, but we also are, are very aware of the limits of AST itself, um, you know, with its budget, its resources, its uh, its its licensing job and, and other and other responsibilities for how much it itself could add new content and so I think that drove a lot of our discussion or a lot of the discussion that I heard in the working group uh, with regard to making sure AST uh, was looped into these existing efforts and and contributing to them uh, where it couldn't maybe stand up its own effort of that scale. Absolutely, thank you, Mike. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So in addition to working closely with the administration and various agencies already uh, supporting this effort, uh, the group came up with several recommendations on how to better engage with industry, such as establishing a mechanism for industry inputs into transportation-related tasks of the interagency roadmap to support space-related STEM education workforce, uh, establishing executive level, level workforce development officers to build strong local and regional STEM workforce pipelines, using spaceports as regional education hubs to support programs and promote space, uh, space industry activities for students earlier in, the, in their education, and disseminate and implement DEI workplace recommendations. As we continue fleshing this out, I believe we'll have uh, much more detail to provide back to AST on, on exactly these points. Uh, 
Uh, next slide. And then finally, working more with universities and student organizations, particularly to highlight space industry jobs that are available and identify academic and extracurricular points of engagement within AST and extending the Centers of Excellence model uh, to promote areas of research interest AST and also to directly support the space industry's workforce pipeline, uh, which would emphasize the employment of historically excluded communities in commercial space transportation. Hi, hi, Karina. <clears throat> uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, uh, Ted Mercer here. Just, uh, just a thought uh, that that I think we should fold into these recommendations that I that so far I haven't uh, seen that we recaptured, and that was uh, the effort to focus on engaging at the middle school uh, levels, middle school and. Uh, and, and high school to, to, to generate that interest uh, in middle school into, into STEM and uh, getting children focused on the, uh, the hard sciences earlier uh, in their lives by generating excitement with visits to uh, spaceports or launch activity or uh, our mentors of engineers that work in the space industry, any number of things, and we can figure out what that would look like. But I think in terms of recommendation, you gotta, we gotta have one in there that's either woven through these or standalone that talks to, specifically talks to engaging at a much, much earlier level, K through 12. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. I, I know that in the write-up, there were some uh, examples of what companies are doing to engage in K through 12 uh, early. So I think that's a really good point and something we absolutely will highlight in the report. So uh, we're gonna ask the regulatory working group to finalize this report to AST in January to mostly ensure we've captured all of Comstack's input. Uh, but in the meantime, do any members want to provide any additional information to the task? And again, particularly if you feel like we've missed anything. Karina, hi. I just want to um, add a few thoughts to your first bullet there, work with university and student organizations. Um, so I had the opportunity to interview a few uh, college students in STEM fields. And what I found in interviewing them and is that they don't really have a sense for what a day in the life of a, a, a STEM worker uh, in industry looks like. And the difficulty for them is that if they don't understand what it means to be um, a space operator or a launch engineer, and the title of the job doesn't happen to match their major, like electrical engineering or aerospace engineering, there's a mismatch in their ability to assess whether they have the qualifications uh, to even apply for a job. And they don't know what questions to ask about the jobs that um, are made available to them in things like jobs fair, job fairs or on LinkedIn. And so I just wanna highlight um, that what college students are asking for is a little bit of a sense of what skills, specific skills are needed and what kind of work is involved in the jobs that are available so that they can, um, you know, one, shape their education to match those skills that are needed and two, um, better position themselves to apply for those jobs. Thank you, Melanie, that's a really good point. And hopefully some of these employers will have an opportunity to take advantage of bring your child to work day and all the other um, initiatives to get some of the younger folks more engaged in what actually happens within the facilities, within the hangars. That's a really good point. Thank you. Karina, there is a question that came in uh, from the audience or, or from those listening in, uh, and it is, would it make sense for Civil Air Patrol to partner with Comstack or related stakeholders to enhance STEM outreach specifically with respect to space operations. Uh, and Civil Air Patrol has an aerospace education STEM kit program. Uh, so that may be something just to, I'm not sure there's a, a 
perfect answer uh, on the spur of the moment, but something else to think about coming in from the audience or the public. Thank you, Jim. I'll pause for just a second, see if anyone wants to chime in. Having uh, been at a spaceport for nearly 10 years, uh, I totally agree. We worked very closely with the Civil Air Patrol. We got them engaged with a lot of activities that were happening out in Mojave um, at the time with various uh, flights and activities. So I think that's a really good suggestion. Therese, go ahead. Thanks. Um, so at least in our initial draft of the report, uh, we found it really important to try and connect organizations like Civil Air Patrol doing this great um, you know, middle school, high school level um, STEM education with regional activities at spaceports or that might be happening at commercial space companies and sort of saw AST as a good interface there since AST has very limited resources itself, but it can certainly leverage, you know, the companies that are working on commercial space transportation. Um, so hopefully we'll flush that out in more detail in the final report. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Therese. Does anyone else want to chime in on this task? If you haven't really you know, fully thought through um, other contributions or other things you might want to recommend, you will have another opportunity before we close out the written report. And for those who are not on the working group, I just want to mention that we do have in the written report that's drafted, we have an appendix of several examples of what companies are currently doing to promote STEM efforts. And if you haven't participated in that, but would like to provide that uh, back to AST, I, uh, the hope is that those examples might inspire some other ideas on exactly how AST could get engaged in these areas. Okay, if not, I'm going to move on. Uh, we can probably go back to the slide deck here. I'll just talk to this first slide. Okay, well, this is loading up. I'll, I'll start to talk to this. So with respect to the uh, human space flight task, I just wanted to provide some uh, high level comments on uh, with respect to this one. So uh, as highlighted earlier in the meeting, this month, uh, FAAST licensed its 500th commercial space launch, supporting a growing space economy, all while maintaining a perfect safety track record protecting the public. The commercial space industry appreciates AST recognizing the importance of maintaining a competitive space program, as well as the reliance on commercial space vehicles to support the US government's needs and working closely with industry to ensure the highest levels of safety. While 500 licensed launches is a significant milestone in providing the, or excuse me, improving the viability of the commercial space industry, the percentage of launches involving humans is extremely low. Both industry and the FAA expected the launch cadence over the past seven years to be much greater by 2022. But in reality, human spaceflight launches are still sporadic and relatively rare, and there's not a consistent or regular launch cadence for human spaceflight missions. The learning period was established as an opportunity for both the industry and regulators to learn how to potentially regulate human spaceflight in the future. Given the low launch cadence from a limited number of operators with dissimilar vehicle systems, there remains limited flight data available to inform both the industry and the FAA. With respect to the FAA's draft report to Congress, the working group understands the challenges the FAA faces answering specific questions about regulation. There were some key points that stood out as we gathered input from the working group. We appreciate FAAST involving the Comstock in its response to Congress, and we stand ready to provide input going forward. Some of the top level feedback is as follows. The report should elaborate on what indicators were used to determine industry readiness. I, I should repeat that because I, missed, I uh, miss, misspoke here. The report should elaborate on what indicators are used to, to determine industry readiness. The report should adopt a more accurate depiction of the goals of the learning period. For example, that it includes allowing the FAA and industry to gain experience and collect data. The report appears to suggest that the FAA should regulate for mission success 
uh, success post learning period, but does not explain which aspects of the industry should be regulated and why. Standard setting efforts, such as those conducted by ASTM, should receive more prominent focus in the report. We suggest a more fully uh, outline uh, what, uh, excuse me, we, we suggest a more fully outline what proposed transition would be per the congressional language. And we also suggest AST acknowledge and build off the last Comstack safety working group effort. Comstack and the commercial space operators should be consulted to update and revise the 2014 recommended practices for human spaceflight occupant safety. We look forward to working with AST, not only to help address the response to Congress, but also to help inform any future regulatory process as launch cadence increases. We anticipate the safety working group will largely focus on these areas during Comstack's term. We really appreciate the opportunity to provide the initial feedback and I'll turn it over to Mike French to provide any additional comments on this topic. Thanks, Karina. I uh, just wanted to, you know, sort of second some of the summary you you provided um, on on the overall discussion we had at the at the working group level on this task. Um, I think driving that discussion is when we looked at and we look at the statute um, that uh, we're currently operating under, um, a fairly thoughtful uh, set of requirements that were put in there that were to take place on a yearly to to every other year cadence, sort of culminating in this. Um, in this, this report that AST uh, now has due. Uh, and I think uh, given, given how the statute is, is built in that way, it is particularly important to, to us as a group um, called out in the statute to comment on the report uh, that, that we get from AST a report that meets you know, as much of that intent that, um, and uh, explicit direction in the statute uh, uh, that's there. So uh, I just, I think that, um, you know, appreciate the work that AST has done uh, getting us, you know, to this point, uh, but from the working group, certainly uh, quite a bit of interest in continuing that work, uh, containing um, a little bit more information along uh, the lines outlined by Congress, and particularly to make sure we take advantage of some of the really good work that the safety working group did earlier this year, uh, as well as further think through what is that transition phase. Uh, thanks, Karina. Thank you, Mike. We're happy to have some discussion with uh, any members. Um, I feel like we're uh, there's still so much to be done on this topic um, that you know a, a lengthy discussion might be a little premature. But if anyone would like to speak up on this topic, you're definitely welcome to. Hey Karina, it's it's Mike Moses, and and I know we haven't gotten introductions yet, but I uh, I'm going to be taking uh, the chair of the safety committee uh, or the sort of safety working group along with the other members, and and I think you know we're looking forward to this challenge. I think you set it up really well uh, that it is a very uh, a, a deep topic, and and Mike to your allusions, right? There was a framework laid out. I think we want to do a measurement health check of where that progress has gone, uh, and then a really good. Uh, integration into how this moves into into what Kelvin was talking about at the beginning, the, the rulemaking committee that will eventually take up Part 460 and the uh, uh, human occupant safety rules. So I think this is a, a great time for it, right? Industry is extremely focused on human spaceflight safety, human occupant safety. Uh, but you're right, the cadence and the numbers have been really, really small, and the diversity of approaches is, is quite large. So I think uh, I'll speak on behalf of the safety working group, but anybody feel free to, to chime in that um, we'll tackle this one in earnest uh, and with a great deal of enthusiasm. Thank you, Mike. Any other comments on this so far? Okay. Great. I do feel, you know, we have a real opportunity, as I mentioned, within this group to work through a lot of these challenges that we have uh, that, uh, that AST is working through as well. And we anticipate largely this will be done within the safety working group, as I mentioned. So the thing I'd like to do next is introduce the working groups 
that we anticipate over this next term. Uh, go ahead and gather. Yeah. Okay, so we anticipate uh, four separate working groups. In the last ComStack, we had three, and then toward the end of it, we started getting much uh, thinking through much more topics regarding research and development. So this term, we just decided to split it out as its own working group. So the four working groups for this ComStack will be regulatory, safety, research and development, and innovation and infrastructure. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. I, I won't uh, read off all the names. I'm just going to highlight the chairs and co-chairs of each of the working groups. So for the regulatory working group, our chair will be Karen Shenwork and co-chair will be Janice Starzik. And we're anticipating a lot of the focus on the regulatory working group, at least initially, to be on Part 450, uh, both implementation advisory circulars uh, or other topics that may come up with, uh, with respect to 450. We think that's going to be the initial task. And I should mention, we expect to issue the tasks uh, in January for the four working groups. And that will give you about uh, three months really to, to go through uh, the, the tasks in detail with your individual working groups and then provide those recommendations back to the full comp stack so that we can discuss them in the public meeting in April. And the next slide, the safety working group is as follows uh, on your slide with the chair being Mike Moses and co-chair is going to be Dr. Michelle Parker. And as we mentioned, we feel the safety working group will largely focus on uh, both safety recommendations, but uh, primarily human space flight recommendations as we move forward with those types of tasks. Next slide. Research and development, our chair will be Dr. Mori Baja and co-chair will be Sita Asante uh, with uh, the following members here that are listed. And as I mentioned, toward the end of the last ComStack, there were so many interested, interesting topics that really fit better in the R&D area. So this is the reason we split that out um, within its own working group. So some, some things that continue coming up within the industry are things that are propellant related or hazard area related. So these are the types of topics we anticipate the R&D working group to focus on. And next slide. And finally, uh, the Innovation and Infrastructure Working Group, will, which will be chaired by General Ed Bolton and co-chaired by Melanie Presser. Uh, the Innovation and Infrastructure Working Group uh, will have a lot of focus on, obviously, innovation infrastructure um, in terms of the critically uh, important launch infrastructure around the country to ensure that we have that assured access to space um, all over the country. And we also expect the, uh, this group to work through any new innovation type topics of interest for the industry as well. So as I mentioned, we do expect to provide working groups with their spring tasks in January to complete the, uh, be completed by the April meeting. I'm gonna pause here and see if anyone has any questions about the working groups, the, uh, the general topic areas I mentioned uh, or anything about Comstack going forward that you want to bring up here. All right, quite a bunch today. Virtual meetings typically are. Uh, Jim, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Do we have any public comments? No, at this time, there are no public comments and no additional questions uh, from the public. So we can move on. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, I'll give some closing remarks here and hand it over to Mike. But if anyone does have any uh, final questions or any comments, please feel free to speak up uh, before we close out the meeting. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you all of you for committing your time to the Comstack. We are really pleased by your participation this fall, particularly with the condensed timeline, and we look forward to working with all of you throughout the next two years. As we've heard several times today, the commercial space industry is a significant economic engine, and we have an amazing opportunity here to contribute meaningful recommendations to advance the industry even further. Mike, I'll turn it over to you for any final remarks. 
Thanks, Karina. I just wanted to thank you um, and the AST team, as well as uh, all the members of CompStack. Uh, we've, you know, this has been a, in large part an, an organizing meeting, uh, given, you know, the announcement was fairly recent here and, and trying to get some substantive tasks uh, under our belt, as well as some working groups in place. So just wanted to thank you, Karina. I know that's a lot of effort to put that all together uh, fairly quickly here as well as for the AST team uh, for, for turning that around. So uh, looking forward to a productive 2023 uh, with the whole group. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, my final comment before I turn it back over to Jim to close out the meeting is happy holidays, everyone. We look forward to seeing you all in the spring. Thank you very much, Karina. All right, and I would just like to add my thanks as well. I know this has been a fast paced uh, time for the last month or so uh, since we got everybody nominated and everything set up. Uh, appreciate all the work that you've done so far. I know there's a lot more to come and I know that uh, there are a lot of hot topics out there and uh, I look forward to working with all of you over the next uh, year or two or maybe more on these topics. Um, human spaceflight, as we've heard, is, is going to be a big topic. Uh, what's coming next? What are, what are those things out there that we need to be prepared for? Nuclear guidance is another one that's coming up, as, as had been mentioned by the Secretary and by Kelvin. There's mission authorization. There's so many things coming up uh, that we definitely need your advice recommendations and observations on. So I appreciate what you've done so far and looking forward to uh, a lot more in the future. Uh, with that, are there any fi final closing comments? Kelvin, I believe you're still on the line. Did you want to say anything before we adjourn? All right, hearing nothing, he may have had to step away. But thank you everybody and happy holidays. And as uh, I celebrate in my household with my partner, Robert, uh, we celebrate Christmas. So Merry Christmas to everybody and the happiest of whatever holiday you celebrate with you and your family. And with that, uh, the Comstack for this time is adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody. Happy holidays to all. Best wishes for a joyous holiday season. Thank you. Happy holidays to everybody. Thank you.